This is part of the universe. As human beings, we all live somewhere in the universe. As I say this, the vast majority of us are living in a relatively isolated section of one single galaxy out of millions. Specifically, a solar system with a small collection of planets, only one of which, Earth, is inhabitable. While we'd all like to be able to have first-hand experience of the important things in our lives, the truth is that the vast majority of the things in our universe are simply too far away to be observed as they currently are. We can't see them or hear them, and only in certain situations can we even measure them with mathematics. However, we do have hope for obtaining knowledge. Historically, great philosophers and scientists have believed that the human mind had a colossal power of comprehension, the ability to understand things even when they couldn't be seen, heard, or felt. Things like governments, national borders, economies, and social classes all fall into that category. We can't hold them in our hands, measure them with yardsticks, or bounce light off of them, but we can know about them all the same. These methods, the methods of logic and reason, can be used to gain information even about the least visible and most abstract elements of human existence, like truth, beauty, and merit. But today, we'll be addressing two larger questions, possibly the largest of all. Should we believe that God exists, and more centrally, should we wish to? Now, that last question might seem irrelevant at first. Someone might say that whether or not God exists is a truth claim, and like all truth claims, it doesn't matter how we feel about it. God either exists or doesn't, and all the wishing in the world won't change that. And that's true. However, I'm not saying that if God is desirable, then he exists. That's ridiculous reasoning. The question of whether we should want God to exist is important not because it affects our reasons to believe in him, but because it affects our appreciation of God and his existence. Believers are on a journey of learning to know and love God, and their love of God can therefore be affected by their reasons to desire him. After all, no one desires anything or anyone without any reasons. Unbelievers, despite their protestations to the contrary, frequently make their decision to refuse to believe in God before they even learn about the evidence, on the basis of personal experiences or on some belief they hold about what God would be like if they believed in him. In fact, when you reduce the role of God to just a sort of hands-off creator, most unbelievers have little resistance to the concept. This shows that it isn't really God as such that many of them have a problem with, so much as some specific quality of God which they take issue with. So, even for the unbeliever, learning more about the desirable qualities of God can be of tremendous benefit. In either case, one helpful step leading up to the study of God, or theology, is to ask what there is about God which makes him desirable as part of existence. To know that, we need to start by understanding some basics of the nature of God. Webster's Dictionary defines God as the supreme or ultimate reality, possessing the qualities of perfect power, wisdom, and goodness, who created the universe and who rules it. But we don't really need the dictionary to tell these things about God. According to the best understandings of modern science, the universe came into being about 13.8 billion years ago with the expansion of all physical matter from a single tiny point called the singularity. That matter spread outward rapidly in a motion that's usually called the Big Bang. Before the singularity, however, there was nothing. Most physicists now believe that the universe and time itself began with the start of the Big Bang, the singularity, representing the first moment of existing matter and energy. However, nothing comes from nothing. The difference between nothing and something is always going to be an infinite difference. Therefore, infinite power is needed to produce the universe from nothing. The universe also began with incredibly low entropy, and gained entropy as it expanded outward. Entropy is based on the disorder within any system. Since we're talking about the universe, this means that the early stages of matter in our reality were very finely ordered, with laws like gravity, electromagnetism, and the atomic weak force already established in precisely the right way, so that the entire universe didn't consist only of hydrogen, or a chaotic mass of particles in a vacuum. 
Because of the delicate balance of forces required to make matter stable in any universe, the one who set our universe in motion would have needed intelligence far greater than our own to manage so many variables in the precise relation to each other which would allow chemistry and later life to exist anywhere in the cosmos. Any being with both limitless power and staggering intelligence would also be in a position to claim authority over the entire universe. Finally, whenever someone does something truly terrible to us, like beating us to a pulp and stealing all our money, we recognize that such an act is truly terrible. It's not just that we don't like it when something like that is done to us, an act like that is really wrong. However, just the fact that some actions are really good and others are really wrong implies an actual, real moral standard, which goes beyond the mere physical and even beyond ourselves as human beings. After all, the mugger may not see any reason to dislike mugging you. He gets some cash out of the deal, so he might think it's fine. To say that the basis for moral judgments is real, and not just about how we might personally feel about them, implies a moral authority, which is greater than mortal man, more proper, and the knowledge of which is built into our minds. This means that God is the very standard of goodness itself, and has passed that moral knowledge on to us. Why the standard of goodness, and not of evil? Because if there were some other authority, representing goodness, which could claim that God was bad, then God would no longer be the supreme, ultimate reality. This other authority would be morally superior to him. Therefore, an evil God is a contradiction in terms. But doesn't evil show that a good God can't exist? After all, if God were perfectly good, and also perfectly in control, he'd never allow evil, right? Well, first off, the logic that we use to show both the goodness and the power of God needs to be taken into account and recognized before we address this question. It's important to remember that there's already plenty of independent evidence that God exists and is both powerful and good. For this reason, arguing against God's existence is always an uphill struggle and one where very strong evidence is needed to overcome the evidence for the opposing view. So, is the problem of evil adequate to challenge that evidence? When it's pursued as a logical argument, the problem of evil faces quite a number of problems of its own. To start with, if we claim that there is no real, objective evil in the universe, as many relativists do, the argument breaks down right there, since God is not answerable for evil things that don't exist. Even if you claim that evil does exist, the argument still breaks down, since the existence of real evil means that there is a real moral right and wrong, and therefore a real moral lawgiver. Furthermore, the natural world gives us every reason to think that there may be good reasons why bad things happen. Smaller organisms, plants, fungi, and microorganisms die and are eaten every day without obviously doing anything to deserve it, and if they weren't, life would cease to exist on Earth. The most reasonable conclusion from all of this evidence is that evil is something which can be permitted for the sake of accomplishing some greater good. Anyone who's ever sent their kid to a time-out to teach them an important lesson knows the importance of allowing the badness of suffering in order to accomplish a greater good. Finally, a lot of people think that the real problem is the evil results and consequences that are allowed to take place by God. However, I think that for the most part, these people are selling God's power short. In terms of earthly things, like the destruction of a city, or the loss of an endangered species, or even the wrongful death of an innocent person, it's important to keep in mind that God has the power to make things from nothing and to raise the dead. This power is more than sufficient to repair whatever physical harm is caused by evil people. He just hasn't done it yet. As for the spiritual harm done by our free choices, if God chose to fix that, we wouldn't really be entirely free and we have every reason to think that what God wants is for souls to turn to him freely, not just to eradicate evil. So the problem of evil really fails to overcome the obstacles it faces on several levels. There are also many other more basic proofs for God's existence, but this is enough to show the basic facts about God. So we can know that God is indeed infinite in power, wisdom, and goodness, the creator and ruler of the universe, if we're open to this knowledge. Why would we not be open to it? mainly because we don't understand God correctly or think of him only in terms of one of his qualities, like power, knowledge, or moral authority, without looking at the bigger picture of who God is. So the next question is, what is God really like? God is the ultimate source and foundation of everything that's good and nothing that's bad. 
We know this because to cause bad things would require an imperfect choice in some way. God can't make an imperfect choice because of his moral perfection. We also know that God has given to us a limited ability to recognize good things and to desire them. Food, for instance, or rest, or love, wisdom, joy, knowledge, strength, pleasure. All of these things are desirable by us because all of them are good things. However, just because God created everything that's good doesn't mean that every good thing has been created already. God still has plenty of surprises in store for us, good things we've never even imagined, things we desperately want, even if we aren't fully aware of it yet ourselves. God wants more than anything for us to be happy, fully, truly, and permanently happy. But we can't be permanently anything in this life where we're only mortal and vulnerable to all kinds of emotional distractions. This life is a fundamentally imperfect state in which to live because we're always in the process of losing good things, and nothing good in this life will last. For a God who truly wants us to share in all goodness, another life is necessary. These are the basics of what God is all about. He wants us to enter heaven so that we can share in the countless good things which he has to offer us for the sake of our own lasting happiness. However, there is an obstacle which has the power to keep us from that fate. You see, God is a God of perfect love. Love can only truly be had between multiple parties, and therefore real love requires a loving response. A loving response can only be had by a being who has free will, which is at least one reason why God made us that way. However, free will also opens up the option of us not choosing to respond to God with love, and if we make that choice, God will honor it by leaving us to our own devices. The problem is that since good things can only be gotten from God, being left alone by him means being left without anything good. This is what is meant by hell. Worse yet, a person who has nothing good is quite literally incapable of desiring to turn away from their evil doing, since the desire to turn away from evil is itself a good thing, which the impenitent sinner can't possess without the help of the God who they've chosen not to embrace. By contrast, people who do embrace God fully and are welcomed into his full presence have access to all good things, everything they've ever wanted and more besides, which is what we mean by heaven. With only this much information about God, we can already determine how we should view him as the perfect companion who can protect, please, and guide us far better than we ourselves can, granting our every wish and banishing every sadness if we'll just be willing to follow his instructions. Now, some might look at this as just wishful thinking, that it makes God seem like he was created to fulfill our wishes. But it's actually the other way around. God was not created for us. We were created for him. As St. Augustine said, You move us to delight in praising you, for you have formed us for yourself. If the existence of God seems like a dream come true, this shouldn't come as any surprise to a person who believes that God created us and cares about us. We are, after all, built specifically to be fulfilled by God and nothing else. When you think about it, what are the cravings of man? The joy of accomplishment? There's no greater accomplishment than when you build something that lasts forever and has eternal value. Every person who struggles to reach heaven is doing that very thing. The joy of being loved. An all-loving God is the only one who can reliably fulfill that desire. Attention. What better source of attention than a God who knows everything you have ever done and even knows how many hairs are on your head? Pleasure? Surely if God can create the universe from nothing, he can also give the faithful whatever pleasures they need to be happy. Belonging. Could there be a deeper sense of belonging than to be in the very place you were designed to be in with the person slash people you were made to be with? Excitement. As with pleasure, if God can create a universe from nothing, he can fulfill any emotional need. Security? The souls in heaven are united with the very source of life himself, and as such, they never need to fear death. These are only a few examples of how God, and only God, can truly fulfill both the deepest and shallowest longings of the human heart. We just need to be willing to accept his help. In addition to his practical ability to satisfy our longings, the existence of God also gives us a number of other essential things, like purpose, value, and rights. If human beings were created by God with some goal in mind, then we have a purpose, which we can fulfill or fail to fulfill. This is because the purpose of something is a result of the intentions of its creator. Baseball bats can be used to bludgeon squirrels. 
But that's not their purpose, because it's not what they were designed for. In the same way, we human beings only have a purpose if we were designed with some intended goal in mind. If, on the other hand, we just came about as part of some cosmic accident, and not by design, then we're not made for any sort of purpose, and our lives can have no true meaning. Far from increasing our freedom, what this means is that there is no basis for judging that one person has lived their life well, or another has lived their life badly, because judgments like those depend on the belief that there is some correct purpose which we as human beings are meant to fulfill, a purpose that only God can provide. If God created human beings, then we have value, because God loves us and designed us for himself, a fate far greater than the rest of the physical world. However, if, again, our existence is due to some random, unguided accident, there's no reason to think that the results of that accident have any more value than the mess left behind by an explosion of dynamite in a room full of fine china. Each is the consequence of some random event, and without God no one can definitively show that a human life has any more value than a mass of broken china. Thirdly, if God created human beings, then he, as the standard of morality, can determine what it's right for them to have and wrong to take away from them. For instance, if I need food to survive, and you take that food away from me, that would be wrong, because by doing so you're condemning me to death. I have a God-given right to the necessities of survival, and therefore depriving me of those is a wrong thing to do. This is what the word rights actually refers to. By contrast, if God didn't exist, then no authority would guarantee our rights except our fellow man, and if our fellow man gave us any rights, they could also take them away. So to execute an innocent man just because he spoke out against an oppressive regime would be the right thing to do because in his society he wouldn't necessarily have any right to live. These are only a few examples of the many ways in which the existence of God benefits human life, the many things that he contributes to our existence, things that we can't just fabricate on a whim. Human life simply makes no sense unless we can refer to something greater than ourselves. In short, we lose nothing as a result of God existing and have at least the potential to gain everything. Still, again, there are points of confusion surrounding certain attributes that God has or the way he's sometimes represented, and it's a good idea to address those individually to make certain that the confusion and misinformation can be limited as much as possible. The first thing standing in the way of people choosing belief in God is often the behavior and moral character of the people who claim to be serving him. This was an obstacle for Gandhi, who, after an experience of overt discrimination at a Christian church, observed that Christians are so unlike Christ. This is the sort of news that should humble us, reminding us of how far we still are from perfection. However, it's not a good reason to reject belief in God. Even if every single person is a complete liar about what God is really like, God himself would be totally unaffected by that. The fact that human beings are flawed, whether they believe in God or not, is inescapable and is a natural part of life. This would only be evidence against the existence of God if we had some reason to believe that God made believers perfect in this life, and in fact we have every reason to not believe that. Furthermore, the imperfection of man shouldn't make us dislike God any more than the imperfection of stale bread should make us dislike elephants. They're two separate beings, and God is not at fault for what indecent people do in his name. If anything, we should be more motivated to pursue a relationship with the only truly perfect being just because human beings are imperfect and unsatisfactory. Many people are turned off to God because of his power and authority. It seems strange, but there's a whole ideology going around that seems to assume that any powerful person should be viewed as an oppressor unless they willingly share their power with everyone else. On the one hand, it's easy to see how people might get this impression. Corruption is so common among powerful people that equating power with oppression is an easy thing to do. But it's just painting every powerful person with the same broad brush, which is always a bad way to reason. This idea that God can't be powerful without being an oppressor can be shown to be false on at least two levels. First, that some people achieve positions of power without being corrupted by it. In the case of God, his perfection makes corruption impossible for him, so there's absolutely no risk of him choosing to use his power to oppress anyone. The second level is to simply show that not all power is oppressive, and it's not rational to expect all power to be shared. 
For example, Usain Bolt is the world's fastest man. He can spread 100 meters faster than any other human being alive, and that's a pretty impressive power that other people don't possess. However, it would just be silly to suggest that he is in some way oppressing slow people by not sharing his speed with them. It would be even sillier to expect him to share a power which is actually part of him. The same is true of God. God's power is his perfection, and that perfection involves being, for instance, truly self-sufficient. In order for any of us to share in true self-sufficiency, we would need to have never needed a creator, which is impossible. You can't make someone not need your help. It's a self-contradiction. No matter how much goodness God shares with us, his full power is just a part of his nature, which is even more impossible to share than running speed. So to be hostile towards God just because he's powerful isn't a rational position. While the image of God being a good shepherd is pretty unthreatening nowadays, mainly due to a decrease in the number of shepherds, the image is less relatable now in the same way that an analogy about blacksmiths would be, one description of God that continues to give people problems is the image of God as a loving father. This was a problem at least as far back as the 1500s, and probably much further than that, and it remains a problem today because when fathers are not loving, or aren't seen as being loving, people start to find the father image repulsive. In American culture of the early 21st century, this is especially bad, with nearly all popular media depicting men as hopeless idiots who need to be kept on track by their smarter, more stable female friends. Still, a much bigger influence than even the media has been the sexual revolution and divorce, causing children to be born out of wedlock or lose their fathers midway through childhood, in many cases due to no fault on the part of their fathers. Yet, the message within society is that if anything goes wrong in the family, it must be the fault of the father. This is an extremely unhealthy environment to exist in, and it does prejudice people against father figures as a whole. However, God is unchanged by the views of society, impossible to deprive of his fatherly role through any kind of legislation, and because of his moral perfection, God will never make the mistakes that human fathers often make. God isn't selfish, trying to use us for his benefit or his ego. He isn't abusive, hurting people for his own gratification. He's not a heartless authoritarian, trying to utterly control us or keep us from achieving our potential. These are qualities that human fathers often have, but none is had by God because of his moral perfection. The same is true of God's representation as a king. In human society, kings and other politicians are usually capricious, greedy, and power-hungry. But God, being morally perfect, has none of that. He sets down rules for people to follow so that people will, by following those rules, be able to accept his gift of heavenly happiness. God has no need to protect his position of power like some human politician through manipulation and control. God's perfect knowledge, or omniscience, is sometimes seen as a threat. Some people think that God will manipulate them or control them by using his omniscience, removing their freedom. But just because someone can predict your actions, that doesn't make you any less free. Suppose, for instance, that I was about to go to the store for a loaf of bread, and on the other side of the world, some fortune teller predicted that. Would my decision to go to the store be any less free as a result? No. So God's knowledge of the events of our lives shouldn't be threatening to us. The only situation where I can picture God's omniscience being seen as a threat would be for a person who expects him to use that omniscience to thwart their plans. However, again, God's moral perfection means that he'll only thwart plans that aren't for the best. If a person is willing to defend the value of their plans, even despite knowing they're not for the best and against God, who knows better, then they've already rejected God and probably see him as an adversary as well. There's no reason to be afraid of God's omniscience if you haven't already decided to be his enemy. Some people have a problem with the idea of God being worshipped in churches. After all, the best people are the ones that don't constantly need praise and attention. This, however, is a misunderstanding of the purpose of worship. God is not needy, constantly requiring our attention, and certainly nothing about his power, knowledge, love, or authority depends upon our support. God wants us to worship him because he is the supreme, ultimate reality, and the actual source of all goodness and morality. 
there isn't anything better for us to be devoted to, or anything higher for us to contemplate. Our gratitude to God for all the good he does for us is a good thing for us, and it makes us better people. Our recognition of and appreciation of the goodness and perfection of God is an even better thing, because it helps alleviate the great injustice of how little God is appreciated for his good works. And that's a good thing for us to do, which, again, makes us better people, closer to God, and therefore happier. This issue also challenges some people because they tend to think of God in purely human terms. But the reason why it's unjust for any human being to demand worship is that worship belongs to God alone. There should be a level of appreciation and praise that we give only to God and no one else, because God is simply not like other people, in the same way that it would be unjust to give medals of honor to every soldier, whether they were courageous or cowardly, so it would also be wrong to treat God as though he were just the same as your next-door neighbor and deserve no more consideration. Still, for a lot of people, just the idea of treating anyone with respect and reverence is a big change, and a difficult thing to adjust to. Yes, it can be a challenge, but again... We're talking about someone who's trying to do you a favor here. So I think it's worthwhile to put in the effort, especially since there's no benefit that could be derived from not doing so. This is also the reason why God asks us to obey him and to avoid sinning. It's best for us to avoid sinning and to obey God. But he doesn't gain anything from our obedience. Another issue many people have with God is his goodness. To many people, Goodness is equated with being a gloomy, dispassionate killjoy, unable to have fun, enjoy life, or have a sense of humor. This is unfortunate, because it arises from certain people who, while they may be decent and moral in their own way, assume that the best way to make a positive difference in the world is to scowl disapprovingly at every problem that exists. Of course, none of us should ever approve of evil, but being a constant grouch is something else entirely. Not really sinful per se, but also not very appealing to other people, and for good reason. In any case, while some good people, like St. Jerome, have definitely been grouches, others, like St. Philip Neri, G.K. Chesterton, and Fulton Sheen, have been cheerful people with good senses of humor. Because of this, we know that being grumpy and unpleasant are not part of being a good person. In fact, neither of those qualities is a good quality, so it's unlikely that God himself has either one. To suggest that God lacks good things like cheerfulness, satisfaction, or good humor would be ridiculous, since then he would lack some good thing, and would therefore not be perfect, and would therefore not be God. That's impossible, therefore God has all these good things. Some people genuinely think that belief in God will make them worse people, that you need to be religious in order to commit horrible acts of savage murder and discrimination. Nothing could be further from the truth, and a simple study of the atrocities committed during the 20th century alone will show this. Despite what revisionist historians would have you believe, the regimes that brought about the Holocaust and the cruel tortures and oppressions under Soviet communism were highly anti-religious, secular regimes, and most of the crimes that modern governments and judges are guilty of were also motivated by a purely secular, non-religious mentality. Certainly, not all non-religious people are savage barbarians or murderers, just as not all Christians are holy and virtuous. But at the very least, we have no reason to think that religion is a necessary component of extremism or terrorism. On the contrary, we have every reason to think that religion can be a very good thing for society and for mankind, bringing good things to people that they wouldn't have otherwise. Throughout history, many people have built monuments, founded schools and hospitals out of love for God, or as acts of religiously motivated mercy. I have yet to hear of anyone doing such a thing because of their commitment to agnosticism or atheism. Finally, sometimes people are concerned by the holiness of God, the fact that he seems to have very high standards. In a certain sense, that's true. God's standards are the highest possible because he's perfect. But in reality, most of us also have very high standards. We just can't fulfill them on our own, so we learn to make do. Well, God can fulfill his own standards, but is well aware that we can't. So rather than hold us to those standards, he offered us a way to heaven without conforming to them. Essentially, God's standards of perfection are high, 
but not really relevant when we're talking about the salvation of souls. We don't need to be perfect in order to be saved. In fact, if we were already perfect, it would be impossible to save us. The standards that we do need to measure up to are much lower, seeking forgiveness when we sin, and trying to do our best to build a relationship with God, on our end, by obeying His commandments. Things like not murdering, stealing, being honest and faithful, that sort of thing. Keep in mind, God knows that we're going to weaken at times and make mistakes, and He's ready to forgive us if we really want it. Human beings are never quite that willing to forgive. The truth is that the most difficult thing about maintaining a relationship with God is learning the truth about what he's really like and what's really needed from us. And that's only difficult because there are a lot of people in the world who are wrong about those things, or even just flat out lie about them. So that you need to be careful and judicious in selecting your sources. Not everyone tells the truth about God, but God himself is still truthful. As it says in the book of Romans, but God is true and every man a liar. So there are good reasons to think that God is the ideal companion for any human being, willing and able to fulfill all our desires, provided we join him in the next life. There are no good reasons to reject this offer or to think of God as an enemy, and no comparably good reasons to think that God doesn't exist, but there is the occasional excuse that people sometimes use. Now, I say this is an excuse because if you seriously examine it, it becomes obvious that it's not a good objection, the fact that you can't discern God through science alone. This fails on a few different levels. First, it's rather like claiming that nouns and verbs don't exist because you can't discern them with mathematics alone. Nouns and verbs are not numbers, and therefore you shouldn't expect to be able to discern them through mathematics. In the same way, science is only one of several methods for discerning truth. Specifically, the method that focuses on the physical and measurable world exclusively. The physical world, however, starts with the Big Bang, and therefore is a created thing. So God is not part of the physical world, and it's just as impossible to measure God as it is to measure anything that's infinite. It's like trying to use science to measure the extent of the human capacity for knowledge. These things are not material substances, so it's nonsensical to expect science to discern them. In short, expecting proof of God to be scientific from start to finish is either not rational or not honest. Secondly, we don't deny the existence of something just because it can't be discerned through science alone. If we did, we would deny the rules that govern science, because they also can't be discerned through science alone. Thirdly, it's impossible to discern through science alone that we should only accept what can be discerned through science alone. Therefore, we have no reason to agree with this idea. Now, I have heard some people defend this kind of hardline scientism by saying that they use it because it works. But again, that assumes that we can gain some understanding of whether a method of reasoning has worked purely on the basis of experiments. That's false. Our reasoning method will need to be used to interpret the results of our experiments. So we can't use experiments to prove a reasoning method. It has to be the other way around. Of all the creatures living on Earth, human beings are unique. But not just because of our intelligence or our attachments to each other, or even just because of our free will. You see, human desires are special. We're never really satisfied. No sooner do we get something than we immediately want something better, and no matter how many good things we may have, we're always looking for more. While this has definitely caused most of our temptations towards greed, desiring more is not in itself a bad thing. In fact, it might well be the primary signpost to tell us about who we really are. Food, clothing, excitement, belonging, pleasure, entertainment. Food runs out and doesn't fill you for good. The same clothing isn't always useful or desirable, depending on the weather and other things. Excitement, belonging, and pleasure don't last, and even entertainment gets boring after a while, if we see the same thing too many times. When all is said and done, these things don't fully satisfy. We're not wrong to desire them, but they're not enough. These things are not sufficient because they're good, but limited. No animal ever has a craving for anything limitless. Human beings are utterly alone in this desire. We crave good things without limits and restrictions, but in this world of measurable distance, continuous space, and linear time, everything seems to be governed by numbers. The limitless goods that we need are just not anywhere around us. 
So how is it that we poor humans, part of this natural world, have this deep abiding longing for something totally beyond the scope of nature? The answer may be yet another good reason to long for the supreme and ultimate reality. No topic could be more serious or important than this one when it comes to our search for that lasting happiness that everyone wants. To believers, these issues provide a series of reasons to love God and cherish the many clues we've been given about him. We see in him the ultimate destiny of man, final and lasting happiness, a free gift to be freely accepted or rejected. To unbelievers, these same issues could open up whole new areas of study, new questions to ask, and new answers to seek. If nothing else, the revelation that God is entirely desirable might help to inform the unbeliever when he seeks to understand believers. No matter who really wants that understanding, it will be there for them, here on earth or in distant places, beyond what we can even imagine.